Today we're going to be looking at a poem from the Love and Relationships Cluster. We're going to be looking at Eden Rock by Charles Causley. I actually think this might be one of my favourite poems from Love and Relationships, I think. The poem Eden Rock is a description of a picnic the poet had with his parents as a child. Now, Eden Rock is not a real place, it's a fictional place. And because Eden connotes paradise, it shows that the poet is really fondly looking back at this childhood memory. And he obviously cherishes this memory as a symbol of the close relationship he had with his parents. So on a literal level, this poem is simply nostalgic. He's telling us about this lovely memory. But the poem does have a deeper, more symbolic meaning. It could be seen that the poet is imagining his parents in the afterlife, after they have died, calling him to join them, which obviously gives the poem a more spiritual meaning. Let's read it. They are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock. My father, 25, in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed, his terrier Jack still two years old and trembling at his feet. My mother, 23, in a sprigged dress drawn at the waist, ribbon in her straw hat, has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. Her hair, the colour of wheat, takes on the light. She pours tea from a thermos, the milk straight from an old HP sauce bottle, a screw of paper for a cork, slowly sets out the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. The sky whitens as if lit by three suns. My mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. My father spins a stone along the water. Leisurely, they beckon to me from the other bank. I hear them call, See where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. I had not thought that it would be like this. Love it. Now I'm gonna take you through the poem bit by bit. Make sure you know exactly what's going on and that you understand it. And along the way, I'm going to pick out around two, three, maybe more of my favorite juicy quotations. And by juicy, I mean quotations that have interesting language devices that you can give multiple interpretations about or interesting words that you can zoom into. So if this poem comes up in your exam, you are able to write long, detailed, analytical paragraphs about it. So the poem begins, they are waiting for me somewhere beyond Eden Rock. So it begins with a really simple declaration that the speaker's parents are waiting for him. Now it's unclear whether he means they're waiting for him in heaven or in the childhood picnic. But I wanna analyze this quotation, copy it down for me. Let's write down some really detailed notes. I like to write them down as a mind map. So write the quote in the middle of the page and then just do lines coming out of it, out of every word, but do it however you feel comfortable. The speaker begins the poem in the present tense. They are waiting for me, which for a memory is really unusual. If I was talking about something that happened in my childhood, I would say they were waiting for me, okay? But it's almost as if he is reliving this memory and has slipped back into that moment from his childhood. And there's that pronoun they referring to his parents although he never makes it explicit that he's talking about his parents at this point. Perhaps because the grief of losing his parents is too painful. So he just says they, rather than saying my parents, my mum and dad, it hurts too much. And that they juxtaposes with the singular personal pronoun me, implying the speaker's own isolation and his desire to be with his parents. They versus me, I'm alone. When he says they're waiting for him, he could be referring to the time of the picnic where he felt happiest, or he could be saying it's following their death when he can reunite with the people that he loved the most. Now, Eden Rock is a biblical reference. 
to the Garden of Eden, which was a paradise designed by God for Adam and Eve to live in. This reflects the speaker's glorification of this memory as he imagines the scene to be so perfect, it's almost divine. And look at that preposition beyond. This is beyond Eden. And it displays the speaker's belief that his parents must be in a place that's even more idyllic. It's even better than heaven. They must be even happier than if they lived in the happiest place ever. His parents' love for him is made clear in the verb waiting. He's convinced that his parents are incomplete without their son. And he wants to be a family unit once again. There is a great sense of loss in this opening line. He then describes his dad and says, My father, 25, in the same suit of genuine Irish tweed, his terrier Jack, still two years old, trembling at his feet. The words same and still, it's the same, it's, the, it's still, it's all associated with familiarity, which provides comfort to the speaker, creating the sense of nostalgia. Oh, that's the same, that's still, it's all stuff that he recognizes. And the genuine Irish tweed and his father's Terrier Jack, they are all comforting, positive symbols of the speaker's childhood. They would have been a source of happiness for the family. Oh, I remember our dog. Oh, that suit that dad always used to wear. The description also shows how vivid this recollection is for the speaker. He remembers every single detail. He remembers the dad's material of his suit. He remembers the movement of the dog at the feet. He remembers everything. He then describes his mum and says, my mother, 23, in a sprigged dress, drawn at the waist, ribbon in her straw hat. We can look at the possessive pronoun here, my, when he talks about both of his parents and it shows the significant impact they had on the speaker and the closeness that he feels to them. My parents, my mum, my dad. Again, his memory of his mum's clothes uses sensory description and it shows the closely observed details, which suggests that he really misses her. The sprigged dress basically means like patterned using natural designs. So he's reminiscing about the vibrancy she provided, but also connecting his mum to natural elements, which kind of conveys the purity of her soul. He says, has spread the stiff white cloth over the grass. Her hair, the color of wheat, takes on the light. I think that's such a beautiful image to describe your mum. The speaker's love for her is clear in this description. I think we should actually copy this quotation down. I think we should analyze it. The way he links his mum to these positive images like white, light, demonstrates his admiration for her. The image of the white cloth actually religiously symbolizes her spiritual purity. She's not tainted by sin. She's like a clean cloth. It describes his mum as holy. The color imagery of her hair, the color of wheat, is a metaphor for the way she nurtures her family. Just like wheat is used to make flour, it shows his mother is integral to caring for this family. He could have literally said her hair is the color of like anything. He chose wheat in particular. And the color of wheat is golden, just like the sun. So it's like the mother has the same qualities of warmth, creation, and strength that the sun has for the speaker. She likes sparkles with joy, whilst also being a powerful force for survival, like the sun at the same time. When it says her hair takes on the light, it makes the mother seem so beautiful that she's almost like an angel or divine. I'm not done yet because remember your marks lie in your analysis. The more interesting things we could say about one quotation, the higher the mark we will get. So let's zoom into the sibilance now. It says spread stiff. And that indicates the soft tenderness the gentleness that the speaker links with his mother. 
with the adjective stiff though, still creating the impression of strength and authority. He says she pours tea from a thermos, the milk straight from an old HP sauce bottle, a screw of paper for a cork, slowly sets out the same three plates, the tin cups painted blue. The poet shifts here from like the spiritual and the divine to the ordinary and mundane. We're just watching them kind of pouring out tea and stuff. Now, clearly the family were not rich. They weren't very well off because the milk is in an old sauce bottle. It really reminds me of my own kind of childhood picnics where we would just like wrap random things in foil and put things in old bottles. But that image is so relatable. It obviously doesn't matter to the speaker that they weren't rich. The intricate description of each specific detail emphasizes how these seemingly ordinary memories are transformed in his mind to become so significant, so poignant for the speaker. It then says, the sky whitens as if lit by three suns. That's obviously hyperbolic and it makes the whole scene seem almost supernatural. It creates a supernatural image to show how bright that moment was to the speaker, how much joy that memory has brought into his life. Also though, this could be a biblical allusion, you know, three sons. It could be a biblical allusion to the Holy Trinity. In Christianity, you know, it says the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, they're known as the Trinity, so that three different people can carry one God inside them. So it almost symbolizes the way the speaker feels that his family transcends mankind and he almost worships their memory. If I was to go deeper then, I would say the sky whitening also could symbolize like a strong heavenly light. You know when you're about to die and it's like the sky turns white. It's like it's calling the speaker and you're like wondering, has his time come to leave this temporary life? And is it time for him to join his parents in the afterlife? He then says, my mother shades her eyes and looks my way over the drifted stream. My father spins a stone along the water. The stream here is really interesting because it's become a metaphor for the distance between the parents and the child, as well as the gulf between life and death. The child must cross this stream if he's to join his parents. And the mother basically looks directly at him and she's encouraging him on this journey. And then the final section of the poem gives it layers of deeper meanings. It says, leisurely they beckon me from the other bank. I hear them call, see where the stream path is. Crossing is not as hard as you might think. Let's analyze this quotation, let's copy it down. It's really, firstly, it's really sweet because if on a literal level, it's just the parents kind of making him feel better, saying it's not that hard, you can do it, come on, it's that kind of image. But the adverb leisurely kind of adds to this peaceful tone, the slow pace. There isn't any rush. There's no urgency for the narrator to make this decision. No one is forcing him to do anything he doesn't want to do. And that idea is further reinforced in the verb beckon. It's a really gentle call, indicating the parents love the speaker as much as he loves them, and they want him to cross the stream whenever he's ready and come to them. Dialogue is used here for the first time. The exclamation and see where the stream path is. It's showing how they're pointing at the stream in like an excited tone, just like a parent would, guiding him towards the way. Look, it's over there. And if I went deeper into that, I'd say the sibilance in sea and stream creates a sense of peace. And maybe that mimics the moments just before death, where often there's like this sense of resignation and like a quiet acceptance, like my time has come. And they say crossing is not as hard as you think. That has multiple meanings. The parents are being really soothing and telling the speaker not to fear the jump across the stream towards them. Like, don't be scared. Maybe the poet is feeling scared of old age and death. And so he's projecting his parents' voice through memories and reassuring himself that everything will be okay. 
And in this way, the stream becomes a microcosm for the distance between the realms of life and death. In fact, this entire poem can be viewed as an allegory for death. The speaker's parents have already died and the speaker is on the edge of death himself. And this last little bit could be a metaphor for the parents calling for their son to leave the living world and join them in death. Isn't that deep? I don't know if that's sad or happy. It's sad because he's dying, but it's kind of positive because thinking about his parents and the fact that he's going to join them makes him feel better and he feels at peace about it. Yet the poet ends with a cryptic final line. He says, I had not thought that it would be like this. And this leaves the reader, it leaves me with lots of questions. I'm thinking, what's he surprised about? Did he die? Is he surprised how easy it was to die? Is he saying, I didn't think death would be like this? Is he saying that his life didn't turn out the way he had imagined or hoped? I didn't think my life would be like this. Did he not expect to merge together the past memory of a childhood picnic and hoping for this like family reunion after death? Like what's he actually surprised about? Whatever the interpretation may be, the poem has this great sense of nostalgia overall, but also a deep sense of loss or regret. It's like full of love, reminiscing his family, but it also explores the feeling of being ready to die. Now, structurally, the poem is set out in four regular quatrains. Quatrains are four line stanzas. Regular means the lines are all kind of similar length. But then the fifth stanza is split. And I think the split in the fifth stanza creates like a physical gap for the reader to cross in order to reach the final line. And maybe that mirrors the way the narrator has to cross the stream in order to reach his parents. That's my interpretation. You can have your own. But that's it. That's your analysis of language and structure done. However, in your exam, that is not enough. You can't just analyze language and structure. You also, for those high grades, need to bring in something called context in your essays. And context basically means you need to explain what was going on during the time the poem was written, or tell me something about the poet's life, and then link that to the message of the poem. Like, why do you think they wrote this poem? What were they trying to show the reader? Some interesting context points for Eden Rock are, Corsley was from Cornwall, and he drew many inspirations for his poems from Cornish folk tales as well as the landscapes that he grew up in. Causley's father died when he was very young. I think he was seven due to complications after fighting in the First World War. And then his mother died in 1971. Hence, this poem can be considered to be partly autobiographical because it focuses on the separation of the speaker from his parents. Causely never got married. The poem is set in a fictional location called Eden Rock, but Causley has suggested that this place belongs somewhere in Cornwall. And there you have it, a full analysis of Eden Rock. I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you feel confident that if this poem came up in your exams, you would be able to write some really juicy paragraphs about it. If you found this video helpful, give it a like and don't forget to check out the rest of the videos in this series.